In a previous video, we built a chatbot web application called Rusty Llama that uses Rust on the front end and Rust on the back end. People have been asking me how I might deploy this application such that it's publicly accessible. In this video, we're gonna go over a way of deploying your web application in a way that I believe to be the easiest and most straightforward, and also one that lends itself to being able to handle massive traffic volumes. But it's also a good approach if you're not expecting much traffic at all. It's perfect timing because this video is sponsored by Docker. So thank you so much to Docker for supporting the channel. Docker's support of this video won't have any effect on the approach I take, I'd be using Docker regardless. Now, if you're not familiar with Docker, basically what you need to know is that once you've created a Docker image of your project, you can then go and deploy your project to any cloud provider that supports Docker images, which is pretty much everybody. So you can kind of think of Docker as a universal adapter of sorts between software developers and deployment platforms. As a first example of how to create a Docker image out of a project, I'm gonna go back to a project that I worked on last year called Actix Web Task Service. No need to understand what the service does to understand how to create a Docker image out of it. Long story short, it's a backend service that exposes some REST APIs that a hypothetical front end might use. Kind of the centerpiece of creating a Docker image from a project is the Docker file. And the Docker file has its own syntax. And most people aren't really working with Docker files every single day. So when you do have to go and create one, you might not immediately remember the syntax. There's a cool feature in Docker called Docker init. And Docker init basically runs you through a series of questions and will automatically generate a Docker file for you that has kind of the basic scaffolding of what you might need. And for some applications, it might be all you need to create a Docker image that you can then deploy to some cloud service. So I'm gonna go ahead and walk through that. Let's do docker in it and it's going to ask me a series of questions again i'm in the actix web task service directory so it's detected that this project is rust and you can see there's ob other options too there's go python node so this is not specific to rust at all i'm going to select rust it actually detects what rust version that i'm using based on the files in the project which is 1.71 press enter it's going to ask what port my service listens on this particular one listens on port 80 so i'm going to put 80 and done now the docker ignore file and Docker file are created. It also creates something called compose.yaml, which is kind of handy for testing your Docker image locally, spinning up a Docker container. First, let's look at what it created in that Docker file. I'm not gonna go over everything in here. I'm gonna kind of go over the high level ideas. In our next example project, which is Rusty Llama, I'll kind of go more into detail. But essentially what this is doing is it's creating what's called a multi-stage build. It creates a container for building the project and then another container for specifically for running the project. That's handy because you don't necessarily want the Rust build tools in the container that is actually running your application, that'd be a waste of space. There are two lines in this file that you'd wanna hone in on first. The first is this from rust colon rust version dash slim dash bullseye as build. What the from statement does is it says, I wanna create a Docker image based on another image. And these are the series of steps to create that image. This one is gonna be based on an officially supported rust build tools image, which in turn is based on an officially supported Debian image. Bullseye is actually a version of Debian and Linux. If you don't know what Debian Linux is, don't worry about it. It's a very popular distribution of Linux. The string immediately preceding the word from is going to be the name of the image that we want to base our new image on. And in this case, that's Rust colon 1.71.0 dash slim dash bullseye. And then we're gonna specify a name for that image so we can refer to it later. In this case, the name is build, makes sense, right? Again, not going into detail on every line. Ultimately, what it's gonna do is run cargo build down here. So we're gonna do cargo build. We're gonna copy the resulting binary to slash bin slash server. And then that's the end of the instructions for creating the build image. When this container's finished running, we should wind up with the server binary in slash bin slash server. The next line is from Debian colon bullseye dash slim as final. So that means we're done giving instructions on how to create the previous image, the build image. After that line are gonna come some instructions on how to build that image that's gonna be used to actually run our application. So it's got a security measure here. It's gonna add another user for specifically for running our application so we don't have to run as root. And then it's gonna copy the build assets from the build container to this image and we're gonna put it in slash bin. We're gonna tell Docker that we need to expose port 80. This project expects to listen on port 80 so we need to make sure to let Docker know, hey, allow people to connect on port 80. And then we're gonna specify the command that we want Docker to run when we spawn a container based on this image. And that command is slash bin slash server. That's the binary that we pulled from the build image or the build container, which is now in the final container. And then 
we can go ahead and run that. And at that point, our application should be running and accessible. Everything I've described so far might actually be sufficient for some applications. This particular application actually uses AWS DynamoDB. So we're actually gonna have to add one line to the Docker file and two lines to compose.yaml. Because this application is making HTTPS requests to AWS, it's gotta have some way of verifying that the person on the other side of that connection is who they say they are. The DB and Bullseye image doesn't have the certificate authority certificates installed by default. So all we're gonna do is install those. We're gonna run apt-get, we're gonna update, and then uh, install the CA certificates package. That's all we're gonna do in the Docker file. The other two lines we need to add are in compose.yaml. So let's open that file. I'm not gonna go into too much detail on what compose.yaml is in the context of what we're doing right now. It's, we're gonna use it when we're testing locally. Our project needs to use some AWS credentials when it connects to AWS DynamoDB. So we're gonna use compose.yaml to kind of inject our AWS configuration files into the running Docker container. And we're gonna do that by putting, basically we're linking the AWS configuration directory to an AWS configuration directory inside the container in the home directory of the user that the application is running under. So that's this non-existent slash dot AWS. So our credentials that we're using on our host machine will be kind of inherited by the Docker container that's running locally. In a production environment, you'd use some different mechanism for kind of injecting the credentials or any environment variables really that your application needs to run. Now to test this locally, we're gonna do docker compose up dash dash build. Oh, gotta make sure you have your docker daemon running. Okay, now that my docker daemon's finally running, I'm gonna do docker compose up dash dash build. What this is gonna do is it's gonna create a build container, run through all the steps that we have for the build image, run a final container, and then copy those build artifacts to the final container, and then finally run our application. And in this particular example, we only have one build stage, but you can potentially have multiple build stages that all kind of depend on each other, or maybe two or three separate build stages that don't depend on each other, but they all come together in the final image. We'll see an example of a multi-stage build when we get to Rusty Llama and we can see our applications running. Let's see if it works. I'm gonna open Postman. And again, no need to understand what this application actually does. It's for managing tasks. So we should be able to do get task and it should return a response. And that worked. That means we were able to connect to our service, which is running in the Docker container. It was able to make a request to DynamoDB, retrieve the results, and then give it back to us in the HTTP response. Response. So now I have a Docker image I can go and upload to any sort of software development platform. In the case of AWS, I could go and upload my image to what's called ECR or Elastic Container Repository, more on that later. And I can then go ahead and spin up an EC, what's called an ECS cluster or an EKS cluster and make my project publicly accessible. Now let's take a look at Rusty Llama. And Rusty Llama has a slightly more complex build. It's not gonna get too crazy. Let's go ahead and go into the Rusty Llama directory. Now that we're in the Rusty Llama directory, we're just gonna do Docker in it, just like we did before. And this time it's actually gonna, it's gonna think that this is a node project because we have a package.json, the root of the project, that's for Tailwind CSS. It actually says Rust and Node are detected, which it, it's actually correct about both of them. But we're gonna select Rust. Same thing, it's gonna detect the version. It's gonna ask what port our server listens on. And this one happens to listen on port 3000, so we'll do 3000. And again, we get all three of those files created. Let's go ahead and look at what it created. Obviously it created pretty much the same thing it did before, but this time, although having Docker in it set up the scaffolding is handy, we're gonna have to make some more, slightly more substantial changes to what it did. Kind of the basic premise of what it's doing, doing the build and then the creating a container to run the application, that's gonna more or less stay the same, but we are gonna have kind of a two-stage build going on here. So I'm gonna go ahead and delete a lot of the comments that Docker init puts in here so you can kind of see everything together a little bit more easily. Okay, so I've removed all the comments and things that we're not actually gonna use from what Docker init generated. So now you kind of have a bird's eye view of what's going on. We still have these two arguments that Docker it created and then we still have the build container that has the rust build tools on it and we still have the container that the application is still going to run on ultimately and we have app user as well the user that our application is going to run as so it doesn't have to run as root so all that's still there and of course we're going to expose port 3000 and ultimately runs the binary at slash app slash server first thing i'm going to do is add some arguments so we're gonna add the node major version, which is 20. This is gonna help with our Tailwind CSS build and our the name of our model. This is just so we know the file name of the model that we're gonna be copying to the final build image. You'll see how that's used in a little bit. And then we're gonna add another build step. 
which is for the Tailwind build. The image with the Rust build tools on it is based on Bullseye Debian, which I think is Debian 11. And Debian is known to be kind of a stable distribution, which unfortunately means that it doesn't always have the most up-to-date packages. In fact, they're usually fairly old. Consequently, it doesn't have the latest version of Node and Tailwind CSS relies on a fairly recent version of Node.js. So we can't actually do the Tailwind CSS build on the Rust build machine or the Rust build container. We could kind of bend over backwards and install the latest version of Node and Tailwind CSS on the Rust build machine, but you kind of have to jump through some hoops to get that working. And there's really no reason to because we can just spin up a whole separate container with the latest version of Node. And these Node images, I believe, are officially maintained. So we can be sure that this image has Node properly installed and it's a relatively recent version. So we're going to make a separate container and call it Tailwind build and just run the Tailwind CSS build. And then from the build container, we're gonna wind up copying the output of that Tailwind build to the build container, which is gonna be sucked in by the Rust build. So we'll see that in a minute. First thing we're gonna do in the Tailwind build container is set the working directory, which is slash app. And then we're gonna copy the necessary files to perform that Tailwind build. The necessary files for the Tailwind build are input.css, which is where we write kind of our custom CSS, uh, the Tailwind config, which is where we specify which files we're gonna be using Tailwind classes in. Um, I'm not gonna go too deeply into Tailwind and how it works, but that's something we're gonna need to actually perform the Tailwind build. And then package.json, which is a list of dependencies, Node.js dependencies that we have. The reason we're actually copying the entire source directory in, which contains all the Rust source files, is because Tailwind actually looks at what classes you're using in your source files, so it knows what to put in the resulting CSS. It kind of prunes out any classes that you don't need. When you think of Tailwind CSS builds, you might not immediately think that the Rust source files are necessary to do that, but they are. And that actually bit me initially when I first started working on this. The, another side note, uh, something to watch out for, is you can't just do this. You can't do copy source dot you might think that's gonna copy the entire source directory to slash app. Unfortunately, it does not. It actually copies all the contents of source into slash app, which is not what we want. So we have to explicitly copy the entire source directory to a directory called source in slash app. And then of course we have to run npm install. That's gonna grab Tailwind CSS, which is uh, listed as a dependency in package.json. And then we're actually run the Tailwind build. We're gonna specify input.css as the input file, output.css as the output file. And so output.css is what we're gonna wind up needing to copy to our Rust build container. Now onto the Rust build container. First, we're going to use the app name variable. So we need to kind of declare that using arg app underscore name. And then we're gonna run apt get update and then apt get install. We're gonna install OpenSSL, similar to how we did in the previous example. And then the lib SSL dev package, which is something that one of our dependencies needs. We're gonna copy everything in the source directory to the build container. And then we're gonna copy from the tailwind build container output.css to style slash output.css, which is where the Rust build is going to expect that to be. And then we're gonna do Rust up target add wasm32 unknown unknown, which is necessary anytime you're compiling WebAssembly. And this is a Leptos application, half of which is a front end component. So we're gonna need that wasm target. We're gonna install cargo Leptos, which is a Leptos specific build tool. It's gonna to handle a lot of the intricacies behind kind of integrating the back end and the front end and building both and putting all the files where they need to be. And then we're gonna finally do cargo leptos build. And then we're gonna pass in the release flag because we want this to be an optimized build. So that's it for the Rust build. Now let's move on to the final container. We're gonna use app name and model name in this container build. And we do need to install OpenSSL as we did in the previous example. We don't need to install libssl because uh, we're not actually doing any compilation. We'll set the working directory to slash app. And then we're gonna copy a few things over. We're gonna copy the model. So we're gonna use that model name argument and we're gonna copy that to slash app slash model. So our application doesn't have to worry about the file name of the model. It knows that it's always gonna to look to slash app slash model to find the large language model that it needs to load. We're gonna copy the binary to slash app slash server. We copy that from the release directory on the Rust build container. And then we're gonna copy target slash site, which is kind of all the static files that comprise the front end to slash app slash target slash site. And that's where our backend component is going to expect those files to be. So it can then serve up those files to the user's browser. And then this is actually gonna stay the same. The Everything about this app user is gonna stay the same as it was when it was generated by Docker in it. But we do need to set some environment variables on the container machine. We need to, the application's actually gonna to look to an environment variable called model underscore path 
to figure out where it needs to load the large language model from. And then Lepto site address is what IP address the application is gonna bind to. And this is actually really important because I think by default, this is set to something like 127.0.0.1 and you do need to set it to 0.0.0.0, .0, so it can bind to all of the interfaces of the container. If you don't do this, I think I mentioned this in the previous example, but if you don't do this, your application will not be accessible from outside the Docker container. So we wanna make sure we bind to 0.0.0.0 .0 to make sure it's accessible from the host machine and elsewhere. And then after we create app user, we're gonna to have to assign ownership of the entire slash app directory to app user because app user is gonna be executing that server binary and then the server and then the server binary is gonna be reading files in that directory as well. So it makes sense to give ownership to app user. And then everything else is pretty much the same. We're going to switch to app user expose 3000 as Docker init put in there for us. Docker init by default assumes that your application is going to be in slash bin. Uh, we just change it to slash app slash server. So that should do it. Now let's try to run this thing. Okay, I copied the entire project over to an EC2 instance. So we should be able to run the Docker build here. The final container should wind up running at the end and the application should be accessible from a web browser running on my local machine. So let's test that out. So do Docker compose up dash dash build. Okay, looks like we're up and running. Let's see if we can get to it from a browser. Okay, that looks good. I've copied the public DNS name of the EC2 instance and pasted it in my browser, added colon port 3000, and we get the Rusty Llama interface. So let's see if it works. Is there love in space? Nice. Okay, that's good to know. And it's, it's reasonably, it's not blazingly fast, but it's reasonably performant. This is on a C7i 2x large instance. If you're interested in that, um, there, there's no GPU acceleration whatsoever. So this is all in the CPU, which is uh, pretty impressive. I think if anyone wants to fine tune this to leverage GPU acceleration on EC2 instances, that would be amazing. I think this would be incredibly fast. I'm currently uploading the image I just created to Elastic Container Registry in AWS. So that'll allow me to deploy to one of the container platforms on AWS. AWS, one of which is called ECS or Elastic Container Service. So I'm gonna try that after this is done uploading. All right, let's see if that worked. There it is. Okay, so we have the image. I'm not gonna go into too much detail on how AWS ECR or ECS works. I'm just gonna show kind of the high level overview. So we've uploaded the Docker image to our ECR repository. Now we should be able to create an ECS cluster that runs containers based on that Docker image. And then in Amazon ECS, I can actually spin up a cluster that will deploy these images as containers on Amazon EC2 instances. So I created a cluster called Rusty Llama, and then I created a service on that cluster called Rusty Service Load Balanced, which has a load balancer. So I could spin up any number of EC2 instances that I want, depending on what kind of traffic volume that I need to handle, and traffic will be load balanced across those instances. The AWS setup here is a little bit involved, and I'm not gonna go too into depth on how to do that, because that's kind of a topic for a whole nother video, and the steps are gonna vary depending on what provider that you're using. In Google Cloud, obviously it's gonna be different, um, but the idea is the same. If I go into networking, I can see the DNS name for the load balancer. So I'm just gonna go ahead and put that in my browser. And there we go, I'm connected to Rusty Llama through that load balancer that's load balancing potentially between multiple EC2 instances. I only have one right now, but if I wanted to add more than that to handle more traffic, I could just change a number basically to deploy more containers to more EC2 instances. So let's try this out. Is there love in space? There you have it. This is a little bit slow because of the EC2 instance that I chose. It's a CPU only instance and it doesn't have very much memory. So long story short, you can use whatever EC2 instances you want and this could potentially be really fast. That's how to create a Docker image out of your application so that you can deploy it to any hosting platform that supports Docker containers which is pretty much everybody, like I said. I hope you got something out of this video. Thank you so much again to Docker for supporting the channel. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.